first question concerns Libya. The attack on our consulate can't be blamed on a reprehensible video insulting Islam. We did everything we could to secure those Americans who were still in harm's way. It was really over before you know, we had the opportunity to really know what was happening. You think the White House is covering something? Special Report investigates Benghazi's new revelation. From Washington, D.C., here is Brett Baird. It's been more than six weeks since terrorists overran the United States consulate in Benghazi, Libya, and murdered our ambassador and three other Americans. It was 9-11-2012. Some of the most important questions still linger unanswered. Who did this and why? Could the attack have been prevented or repelled after it began? What did the White House know and when? Fox News has been on this story from the very beginning. This hour, details you haven't heard. And as we enter the final stretch of the race for the White House, which side is closer to the truth? Those who argue this terrible tragedy was largely unforeseeable and unpreventable and that the president should not be blamed? Or those who say we're seeing President Obama's foreign policy unraveling right on our TV screens? It was supposed to be one of the triumphs of President Obama's foreign policy, a Libya without Muammar Gaddafi. Gaddafi had been one of the world's worst sponsors of terrorism. Families of the 189 Americans murdered on Pan Am Flight 103 in 1988 knew that well. It's true, though, that after the 2003 invasion of Iraq, he even ended his secret nuclear program. I, for one, didn't buy it and was deeply suspicious that Muammar Gaddafi may be playing us. Frank Gaffney is president of the Center for Security Policy. Muammar Gaddafi's transformation from rogue, eccentric, even bizarre terrorist sponsor into one of America's most reliable allies is, I think, going to be seen by historians as one of the more bizarre twists of American diplomatic history. Whatever the case, by last year, Gaddafi became yet another repressive leader, caught by surprise in the Arab Spring of 2010. By the end of March 2011, world leaders are calling for him to go. Muammar Gaddafi has lost legitimacy to lead, and he must leave. President Obama adds more than his voice. He orders the Pentagon to provide air support. One anonymous Obama staffer describes the strategy as leading from behind, a characterization the Obama administration officially rejected. What the Libya operation represented was burden sharing. P.J. Crowley was Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs at the time. The United States participated significantly, uh, but uh, uh, granted greater responsibility to France, Great Britain, Italy, uh, countries that had a much greater stake in the outcome. April 5th, 2011, Gaddafi still holds Tripoli, but the rebels control Benghazi. The State Department sends diplomat Christopher Stevens there. His 12-man team sets up shop in the Tavesti Hotel. June 1st, a car bomb explodes in the parking lot in front of that hotel. Stevens and his team decide it's too dangerous to stay there. In August, they settle on a compound on the west side of the city. It was uh, uh, rented from, a, from an owner who had a nice villa there and several other outbuildings as well. Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood is a 24-year U.S. Special Forces veteran who worked on security for U.S. personnel in Libya for six months before the September 11th, 2012 Benghazi attack. But not a lot of security. Like in any residence, they're, they're not a fortress. Inside the walls are four buildings. One is essentially a large residence with a number of bedrooms in it. Another residence has a cantina where the staff eats. Just across the way is what they call their tactical operations center, filled with offices for security staff, phones, and security monitors. Finally, the barracks, a small house by the main gate of the compound. It will house a Libyan security force. Many viewers, I guess, who've traveled around Europe and Asia probably think one of those heavily guarded fortresses where you go to get your visa. That's not what we're talking about here. Correct. I think the correct term for it is embassy property because it wasn't fortified. CERT Libya, October 20th, 2011. 
Colonel Qaddafi is captured and killed by rebels in his hometown. With Qaddafi gone, Stevens is officially named ambassador. He will spend much of his time at the main U.S. Embassy building in Tripoli. But he'll come to Benghazi often. The State Department upgrades the physical security at that property. Charlene Lamb of the State Department. We extended the height of the outer wall to 12 feet with masonry concrete, barbed wire, and concertina razor wire. Finally, inside the large residence, a fortified safe haven is built. You enter through a heavy metal grill with several locks on it. Tell me about this safe haven. Simply um, bars on windows, bars on the wall. You're just you're building a jail cell, basically. You're going to get inside, and, and it's a delay uh, until you can get some relief uh, to get out of there. After the bombing in Beirut decades ago, we created a minimum standard for facilities across the world. Utah Republican Congressman Jason Chaffetz serves on the subcommittee on crime, terrorism, and homeland security. This facility in Benghazi didn't meet those minimum standards and didn't meet the minimum standards for the number of personnel that should have been there protecting. Security on the compound consists of five diplomatic security special agents and four members of the Libyan government security force called the 17th February Brigade. There is more security at what's called the Annex, now known to be a CIA facility a mile away. Based in Tripoli, but moving around the country, is a Department of Defense site security team. February 12, 2012, Lieutenant Colonel Wood arrives in Libya as the new commander of the SST. It had uh, 16 members? Yes. What exactly did they all do? The site security team was special operations uh, soldiers uh, that had extra skills and capabilities they could bring to the embassy. Could a team that small really make a difference? The caliber of individuals on, on that team were the best in the United States inventory. Yeah, they can make a difference in any firefight. The problem, however, is that SST is slated to end its tour in Libya by summer's end, and the security situation is taking an ominous turn. Spring of uh, 2012, there was an uptick in terror attacks in Libya. Um, is that right? That's true. I, I think the nature of things started to change. Uh, when, when I first got on the ground, it was a lot of lawlessness going back and forth. As things uh, progressed, the commotion settled down a little bit, but the targeted attacks seemed to pick up, and they seemed to be targeting more toward Westerners. Targeting more towards Westerners. Libya had just got over a civil war, but for the Americans stationed there, the danger was just beginning. When we return, Americans in Libya become targets after the break. To our investigation. We told you how Libya, after the death of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, was an unstable and dangerous place. But the violence was mostly Libyan on Libyan, people jockeying for power, old scores being settled. In the spring of 2012, that would change. Americans and their allies in Libya found themselves increasingly in the crosshairs. April 6, 2012, a bomb is tossed over the wall of the Benghazi compound. June 6th, an IED is placed on the compound's north gate. No one is injured in either incident. That's not the case five days later. June 11th, 2012, a convoy transporting Great Britain's ambassador, Sir Dominic Asquith, is ambushed in Benghazi. He isn't hurt, but two of his security aides are. Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood was the U.S. security site team commander in Libya. Clear that was a terrorist attack. I actually uh, conducted an investigation uh, a couple of days afterwards, walked the ground, took photographs, uh, examined the vehicle. So they knew what they were doing, and it was uh, definitely an assassination attempt by skilled operators. But uh, as I could see it, uh, I could see the adversary uh, growing stronger, and, and we were the last thing on our target list. All told, there have been more than 230 security incidents in Libya in the past year. Ambassador Stevens grows more and more worried and says so in a series of cables sent to Washington, like this one on June 25th, entitled Libya's Fragile Security Deteriorates as Tribal Rivalries, Power Plays, and Extremism Intensify. He writes, Libyan extremists are, quote, targeting international organizations and foreign interests. That's why Wood and Eric Nordstrom, regional security officer, implored the State Department 
to keep Wood's SST force in the country beyond its scheduled August departure. We weren't re requesting additional security. We were requesting to keep the security that we had, and that was being taken away. So you want to keep your team on the ground, the, the team that was in place already? Yeah, and my, my team was only a small part. Um, there was MSD, State Department MSD. That stands for Mobile Security Detachment Team. A lot of those are uh, ex-Green Berets, ex-Navy SEALs, uh, excellent A-trained folks. There were three uh, MSD teams when I got on the ground there. August 5th, 2012, state decides not to keep the SST in Libya. The MSD team is being reduced as well. Why do you think this request was denied? I don't know. I really don't know. Former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, John Bolton. I think that what was motivating the State Department was that if we had security that would have truly been appropriate, it would have been an admission that conditions on the ground in Libya were not safe. And that would have violated the world view that, uh, that this had been an administration success. August 8th, just three days after the State Department pulls the heavy security teams from Benghazi, Ambassador Stevens sends another cable about the, quote, violent incidents that dominated the political landscape. Stevens writes, quote, what we have seen are not random crimes of opportunity, but rather targeted and discriminate attacks. Less than a week later, Lieutenant Colonel Wood and his military site security team would leave the country. How did you feel about the security situation when you left? I didn't like it, um, and I, I, I said as much, and my concerns were specifically for Benghazi. Ambassador Stevens was a, a, a great diplomat, and being a great diplomat in a, in a dynamic place like Libya means taking care of lots of different things. Counsel to the Libyan government, David Tafuri, is a former State Department official who knew Stevens. Certainly he was concerned about security. He was concerned about some of the developments um, in Libya. I think he was being a very wise, careful diplomat and taking note of all the things that were happening. September 11th, 2012. That afternoon, a mob gathers at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt. They scale the walls and burn the American flag, angry apparently over an obscure anti-Islam video produced in California. While there's plenty of action in Cairo, all is quiet at the compound in Benghazi. Still, sometime before 6 p.m., Ambassador Stevens sends another cable to the State Department reporting, quote, growing problems with security in Benghazi and, quote, growing frustration on part of the local residents with Libyan police and security forces. These forces, the ambassador writes, are too weak to keep the country secure. A few hours later, he would be murdered. We weren't there. We just weren't there. And if you were, could you have protected Ambassador Stevens? Well, the more guns you have in a firefight, the better chance you have of winning. What exactly happened on the night of September 11th, 2012 in Benghazi? Greg Palcott has been on the scene. Up next, a timeline of heroism and disaster with new details you haven't heard before. You may have seen Greg Palcott's reporting from Benghazi. He started with all the available information from U.S. government briefings, diplomatic cables, emails, and other documents obtained by Fox News. He then gained access to that ill-fated compound. Pulling it all together, he reconstructed what happened that night. Now, he has new revelations with new information that fills in this troubling story even more. September 11th, 2012, 7.30 p.m. The U.S. Ambassador to Libya, Chris Stevens, takes his last meeting on the 11th anniversary of 9-11 in the large residence building with the Turkish Consul General. It ends after an hour. Stevens escorts the diplomat to the main gate. He makes small talk in Arabic to the guard and goes back to the main residence building and retires to his bedroom for the night. Still no sign of any kind of spontaneous demonstration over that web video, a protest the Obama administration would later suggest escalated into a deadly riot. Joining Stevens in the main residence building is Information Management Officer Sean Smith and four diplomatic security special agents. Another agent is at the nearby Tactical Operations Center. 9.40 p.m. 
Some guards at the compound say they could hear up the street explosives going off and people yelling and chanting. A mad mob of attackers break through here, the main gate, a weak point in the defense of the mission. And then they move on here to the understaffed Libya militia barracks. They storm the place, they torch it, they light up embassy cars around it, and then they move on. Witnesses there say the fighters are well armed and organized, flying the radical Islamist flag. Some are wearing Afghan garb and have foreign accents. An agent in the Tactical Operations Center sees and monitors scores of men pouring into the compound. At the annex a mile away, which Fox News has confirmed was a CIA installation, Tyrone Woods, a former Navy SEAL, and other agents can hear shots being fired in the vicinity of the consulate. Sources tell Fox News national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin that they asked permission from their CIA superiors on the scene to assist, but are told to stand down. They say it is the first of two such requests they would make. But the CIA says, quote, no one at any level in the CIA told anybody not to help those in need. Claims to the contrary are simply inaccurate. Meanwhile, security agents at the consulate are sounding the alarm too. A diplomatic security agent working in the Tactical Operations Center immediately activated the imminent danger notification system. State Department official Charlene Lamb was working that night in Washington, and so she could follow the events in real time. He also alerted the quick reaction security team stationed nearby, the Libyan 17th February Brigade, the embassy in Tripoli, and the Diplomatic Security Command Center in Washington. Around 10 p.m., a surveillance drone begins to hover over the consulate and beams back live pictures to Washington. Back here in the main residence, the special agent, reportedly David Ubin, comes here and gets Ambassador Stevens from his bedroom and brings him, along with Sean Smith, to this room in the safe haven. Really, aside from some medicine and other supplies, a big, dark, windowless closet. And then, outside, a locked gate. Hope for security. Ubin radios others as to his whereabouts. The scene at the compound is erupting in gunfire and explosions. At this point, there are seven Americans at three different locations, Ambassador Stevens and two others in the main residence, two special agents at the second residence and cafeteria, and then here in the Tactical Operations Center, two more agents. Attackers all around. Inside the main residence, the attackers come in here and they ransack the place, and then they go for the locked gate. They look inside, it's dark, they can't see anything. And then they try the lock, they can't open it up. Inside, Agent Ubin has got a gun trained on them, ready to shoot if need be. But as Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Wood says, the safe haven is only safe for a short time. It's a delay for an aggressor, um, but it has to rely on someone to come in to, uh, to rescue him as well. That someone, Wood says, might have been his elite site security team, but they've been pulled out of the country. Either way, Stevens, Smith, and Ubin were trapped by diabolical killers who pour diesel fuel around the house, light it, and leave. When we come back, the trapped Americans try desperately to escape. Before the break, Greg Palcott told you how terrorists overran the U.S. consulate compound in Benghazi, Libya. A handful of Americans caught by surprise, pinned down in three different locations. Three of these men, including Ambassador Chris Stevens, have locked themselves in a so-called safe haven in one of the buildings. The attackers can't break in, so they've set the place ablaze. The safe haven has become a fiery jail in the middle of a shooting gallery. Once again from Benghazi, here's Greg Palka. September 11th, sometime after 10 p.m., the compound is under heavy attack. This Libyan militia member says he was there. You can't hear anything from the RPG firing, explosions. The shots going beside you, it's so loud. You can't even take your breath. I can't even move. So it's, uh, it's like organized attack. Meanwhile, the entire safe haven, which takes up half of the first floor of the main residence, is black with thick smoke and fumes. Stephen Smith and Ubin move to a bathroom within the safe area, which has a window. They try to open it, but it doesn't help. There's just too much smoke. So they decide to leave the safe haven and take their chances with the armed attackers who have taken over the compound. 
This is the window that Special Agent Ubin jimmies open and crawls out of, but Stevens and Smith do not crawl out after him. And so, even though he can barely see, barely breathe, he goes back in. In fact, he goes back in and out several times. He can't find them, and he is overcome with smoke. Back at the CIA annex, sources tell Fox News there's another request to go and assist the people at the compound. But once again, they say they're told to stay put. Once again, the CIA says it never happened. Quote, we can say with confidence that the agency reacted quickly to aid our colleagues during that terrible evening in Benghazi. End quote. At the compound, three of the diplomatic security agents make their way to the main residence. They crawl into the residence on their hands and knees, feeling their way through the building to try to find their two colleagues. They find Smith. They pull him out of the building. He's dead. Just before 11 p.m. at the annex, former SEAL Tyrone Woods and five others are said to ignore their orders and race to the consulate. They bring with them 16 Libyans from the February 17th Brigade Militia. Some surround the compound. The others go in. They are unable to find Stevens. By 11 p.m., the Libyan forces say they can no longer hold the perimeter. The attack was so strong and the ammo was finished. So we were calling for backup and uh, even the backup wouldn't came. Meanwhile, the American agents carrying Smith's body pile into an armored vehicle and exit the main gate. They head for the annex about a mile away, but almost immediately the crowd fires upon them and throws two grenades under their vehicle. They take direct fire from AK-47s from about two feet away. Despite two flat tires and heavy damage to their vehicle, they keep rolling. Several blocks away, they hit more traffic in a busy Benghazi neighborhood. The car careens over the middle divider, pushes forward against opposing traffic, and finally makes it to the annex and again, hope for safety. Midnight, some two hours after the attack began, a quick reaction force from the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli leaves for Benghazi on a chartered aircraft. On that plane is former Navy SEAL Glenn Doherty, who will soon be fending off heavy fire. Back at the annex, the battle is on again. Fighters hitting the place with AK-47 fire and rocket propel grenades, forcing those inside to retreat to a building further back in the annex compound. According to Fox's Jennifer Griffin, yet another call is made for military backup. Sources say their request is refused. Meanwhile, special forces are moved to southern Italy, 480 miles away. The Pentagon officials later expressed concern about putting them in harm's way without a clear picture of intelligence. Stationed 1,000 miles away are jet fighters and attack helicopters. Officials say strafing the street was not an option for fear of civilian casualties and collateral damage. Back at the mission, looters enter the building and find the body of Stevens slumped on the floor. Although they don't know who he is, they drag him out through a window. His eyes are dazed, his face smoke-stained, seemingly lifeless. When someone says he is breathing, the crowd is relieved, cheering, Allah Akbar, God is great. Around 1 a.m., Ambassador Stevens is brought by car here to the Benghazi Medical Center where doctors tried desperately to resuscitate him for some 45 minutes. They fail. He dies of severe asphyxiation. After 2 a.m., the fight has been going on for over four hours, and the drone overhead is running out of fuel. A second is sent, just as the quick reaction force arrives at the Benghazi airport. But Libyan officials delay them for 45 minutes, negotiating over who will escort them. They arrive at the CIA annex around 3 a.m. Around 4 a.m., this annex compound is hit by another wave of attacks. It is described as planned and precise. A round of mortar fire targeting the roof of a building set well behind this gate. That turns out to be dangerous and deadly. Badly injured in that attack, Special Agent David Ubin, the same man who struggled valiantly to save the lives of Ambassador Stevens and Information Manager Smith. Two other Americans are killed. Former Navy SEALs Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods, who manned the gun position on the rooftop of the annex. They were hit by a mortar. They didn't go down without a fight. Fox News national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin. We know from witnesses and sources that spoke to those witnesses that Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods, the machine gun that they were sharing on the roof, was caked in blood. It is said that they continued firing and they continued fighting after they were hit. A decision is made to evacuate the whole enterprise. Libyan militia coordinate a convoy to escort the Americans to the airport. September 12th, 8.30 a.m. 
The Americans evacuate on two flights. The second plane leaves with the remaining Americans on board and the bodies of Ambassador Stevens, Sean Smith, and Agents Doherty and Woods. Chris Stevens was the first U.S. ambassador killed on duty in more than three decades. The story moves back to Washington. Up next, new details on the Obama administration's reaction. Was it the fog of war, an attempted cover-up, or something else? Special Report investigates after the break. Returning to our story, it's September 11, 2012. The attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi is underway. Back in Washington, what does the president know and when does he know it? What does he say and when does he say it? Questions that turn this terror attack into a political firestorm. Here's Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry. September 11th, as the attack in Benghazi was playing out, emails cascade into the mailboxes of high-ranking officials in the intelligence community, in the Pentagon, and even the White House. 4.05 p.m. Eastern Time, the diplomatic mission is under attack. 49 minutes later, 4.54 p.m., firing at the U.S. diplomatic mission in Benghazi has stopped and the compound has been cleared. At 5 p.m., the President, Vice President, and Defense Secretary, Leon Panetta, meet in the Oval Office. That's about an hour um, after the attack began. At that time, they would have had a, a drone and a video feed from a drone being fed back to Washington. Fox News national security correspondent Jennifer Griffin. The problem is, don't forget that video from a drone, it's taken from a, an incredible distance. You don't have clarity as to who's who on the ground. You see figures moving. It's hard to tell friendly from foe. 6.07 p.m. Another email states that a terror group with ties to Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility on Facebook and Twitter. Administration officials later say a posting on social media is not in and of itself evidence. 11.57 p.m. Another chilling email. Subject line, Benghazi shelter location also under attack. The next morning, September 12th, President Obama addresses the nation from the Rose Garden, and what he says or doesn't say will become a hotly debated issue over the next days and weeks. Since our founding, the United States has been a nation that respects all faiths. We reject all efforts to denigrate the religious beliefs of others. But there is absolutely no justification to this type of senseless violence. With those words, the president seems to be saying Ambassador Chris Stevens and three other Americans were killed in a spontaneous riot over that anti mohammed internet video and not a planned terror attack. A few paragraphs later, however, he does use the term terror, but in a more general sense after he recalls the September 11, 2001 al-Qaeda attacks. No acts of terror will ever shake the resolve of this great nation. It is a hugely important distinction to some Obama critics like best-selling author and commentator Mark Stein. There are always reasons to riot uh, in the Muslim world. Stein believes the president was trying to dodge responsibility for the attack by chalking it up to the sort of sudden, irrational, out-of-proportion outrage we often hear about in the Muslim world. I happened to be in the Oval Office once, uh, and President Bush gave a, uh, a very droll line. He said, oh, well, it's always something. If it's not the Crusades, it's the cartoons. In other words, you might have riot over the Danish cartoons uh, or a Sudanese schoolteacher's teddy bear or the swirl on a Burger King ice cream tub that happens to look like Allah written in Arabic. There's always a reason to riot. You are aware that we've got an election going on. That afternoon, the president leaves for a campaign trip to Las Vegas. The president of the United States did not postpone a campaign event, even though we had been hit. I said at the time, I thought that that was the biggest political strategic mistake of the Obama campaign. Dana Perino was the White House press secretary for the George W. Bush administration. Morning, She's now a Fox morning, News host. Just imagine if he would have said, as commander in chief, it is important for me to stay back here at the White House. Just imagine, everybody thought, wow, how responsible. Once the president had made his statement, uh, I'm not sure what he should have done. Democrat Eleanor Holmes Norton represents the District of Columbia. Are we supposed to sit in mourning uh, for several days and not go about our daily business? 
September 13th, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton suggests the attack was just a spontaneous demonstration about the anti-Islam video. There is no justification, none at all, for responding to this video with violence. White House Press Secretary Jay Carney explicitly blames the video the next day. These protests were in reaction to a video. We have no uh, information to suggest that it was a pre-planned uh, attack.